Hello and welcome to lesson 16 of the learning guitar series. As you can see this time I don't have a guitar with me and the reason for that is because we're discussing harmonium theory. Um, this lesson is almost back to back with the previous one, with lesson 15. The reason being that uh, in these cases there is no really uh, practice attached to this lesson. So you can still keep practicing what we've done so far. I strongly believe that uh, probably my lessons uh, requires maybe around like a month each of them in order for you to practice what's contained in it and digest it, assimilate it and eventually being able to use it, uh, if you see what I mean. But in this case, because there is no um, no practice that go with it, uh, we can uh, simply discuss it. Uh, one thing I want to make clear to me, harmony and theory is, uh, is a tool. Sometimes I hear people saying that, you know, understanding these kind of topics kind of impair their creativity. And I strongly don't believe in that. If anything, these are, I see harmony and theory a bit like a dictionary. Uh, it's a tool. Sometimes you need an explanation of something or, you know, for an analysis, this is where it comes from. If anything, most of the concept that I'll show you will enhance your creativity. Um, what we'll discuss over time, this is not going to be the only lesson uh, for Amorian theory, but this strictly applies to what we've done so far. So not only will explain you even better what we've done and why it's done in a certain way, but it will also uh, lay the foundation on what's to come. So you clearly understand how things are done. Also, this will help you very much in um, writing solos or you know playing solos over songs that you like so how you analyze a song uh, um, find out what key is it in what kind of scales you could use on top of it etc etc there is a lot that we're gonna get out of this so well brace yourself <laughs> uh, before I move on to most of this lesson is going to be uh, with spreadsheets I'm going to show you a few things and so I'm going to switch the camera off and you know capture uh, capture my screen um, I decided to open a Patreon page uh, some of you suggested that to me and I think it's a good idea in a sense that uh, this is, uh, as you're realizing probably by now, if you've been following this project from the beginning, this is a quite a monumental project. And uh, I would like to keep it free as it is and as comprehensive as possible as it is. Um, so, I, you know, the project could do with, uh, with uh, some, uh, some active support. Uh, if you can afford it. Um, probably you're familiar with Patreon more than I am. Uh, I just discovered it um, kind of recently. And I established different tiers. Uh, the, 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 the minimum one is uh, the minimum that actually Patreon suggested, which is kind of $3.60, I believe, including taxes um, a, a month. And, you know, I think for this kind of content that I'm creating is it's probably worth it. Uh, in time, I'm also creating some extra content specific to more advanced supporters, uh, like uh, backing tracks or some extra lessons. Some, you know, these lessons already kind of dig, dig deep enough into each topic, but I also know that I can even dig deeper. So I'm gonna do some extra stuff for people that you know feel like supporting this project even more actively. Um, anyway, I don't want to waste too much of your time on this. I just, uh, you know, wanted to let you know. And uh, if you decide to become a patron, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, on top of that, via patron, you know, if you're interested, we can also discuss private lessons on topics of your choice. Okay. Anyway, let's not waste too much time and let's get uh, into it straight away. So first thing I'm going to show you is these charts and by the end of this lesson you know you these charts will be attached to the lesson and you can simply download them okay and this is actually the objective of this lesson i'm going to explain you what this is and where it comes from i'm going to do it in uh, layman terms so not always uh, not always what i what i what i will explain to you will be let's say, academically uh, uber-correct. 
But to me, the important, the important of this, uh, the Armani theory is that you understand the logic behind it. Because if you understand the logic behind it, then you know, then there is a lot you can do with it independently from if it's academically correct or not. Let's put it that way. So I'm gonna use layman terms in trying to explain all this. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, we have these charts. Um, which I suggest if you have, um, a, let's say, a practice area, a place where you practice or something, you can actually print them out, uh, maybe put them in a folder or something, so you can consult it when you need it, some sort of diary. Of course, in time, probably you memorize all this. I mean, it's like, I, I kind of know it by art, but it's after many years, obviously. So, and I don't expect you to uh, learn all these things by art. As I say, print it out and uh, occasionally when you need it, uh, you'll just uh, consult it, okay? As I say, like a dictionary for, you know, words, the meaning of some words or the synonyms, etc. The first thing you might want to print out is actually this particular chart. This is a very simple chart. It's uh, a chromatic scale in 12 keys, okay? And when I say 12 keys, actually you notice here is more than 12, but just because I wrote C sharp and D flat, for example, or D sharp and E flat, uh, because maybe sometimes you're analyzing a, a song that you want to play and maybe play a solo on top of it. Sometimes it's written in C sharp, so you have uh, the rest of the chromatic scale in that key, or sometimes it's written in D flat, so so that you don't you don't get confused. Let's put it that way. So here you have your root note and the rest of the scale. Okay. Um, so these are all the 12 notes in a diatonic scale. This is, you know, a chromatic, a chromatic scale. And above it, you'll have the possible uh, name for the interval, okay? In relation to the root note, of course. So from C perspective, C sharp would be a flat two or a flat nine, depending on which octave we're looking at. Uh, D would be a second or a ninth. D sharp would be a flat three or a sharp nine, E would be a third, F is a fourth or an eleventh, and so forth and so on, okay? Again, you see, as we get along with this lesson, how this comes handy. And of course here, like we discussed in, um, in lesson one of this series, just a reference, so chord families, so that you understand that a major chord basically is as such because it contains one, three, five in a particular key. Minor is 1, flat 3, and 5. Dominant 7 is 1, 3, 5, flat 7. Half diminished is 1, flat 3, flat 5, flat 7. Diminished is 1, flat 3, flat 5. Here I wrote 6. Academically, this would be a double flat 7. That's what I meant before sometimes, but to me it's easier to explain it to you this way. Augmented chords would be 1, 3, sharp 5. Suspended 2 or 9 is 1, 2, 5. Sus 4 would be, or sus 11, 1, 4, 5. What does this mean? Well, it means that, let's say that I want to create a C major chord, okay? I need the root, so I need 1. I need the third, and if I look at the chromatic scale, the third is an E note here, and I need a fifth, and that would be G, okay? And I, I don't know, A flat minor. So A flat, then I need a flat three, and the flat three for A flat will be B, and the fifth for A flat will be E flat. Now let's go back to our second chart. So this one, maybe print it out. You don't have to memorize all this. Just print it out as a reference, okay? Um, this is what we're gonna discuss today, okay? Diatonic scales, basically Ionian scale, what you just did, okay, in the first 15 lessons. And we're gonna harmonize them to get chords out of them. And I'm gonna show you exactly what the process is, so you understand how we got to this chart. So here I just wrote like, a, I have an Excel spreadsheet. What I'm gonna write on it is, since we've done most of our lessons in G, I'm gonna write this in, I'm gonna write a G Ionian scale, okay? And that would be G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, and we added the octave. In this case, I'm actually gonna write two octaves of it, okay? So again, G, A, B, C, oops, C, D, E, and F sharp, and we're back to G, okay? Now, the chords, 
are constructed by stacking intervals of thirds. What does that mean in layman terms? Well, let's take a G, let's start from G, and the interval in between G and A is a second, and the interval in between G and B is a third. Okay, so in other words, what I'm going to do vertically now here, I'm going to play a note, skip one, play a note, skip one, play a note, because the, the relation, the interval in between B and D is always a, is also a third. So I'm actually stacking them. So from G, I'm going to write B. Then from B, I'm going to write D. From D, I'm going to write F sharp. From F sharp, we're going to A. That's why I wrote two octaves, just so that you can see how these passages goes over two octaves. So from F sharp, we have A. From A, we go to C. From C, we go to E. And from E, we're back to G, okay? Now, what's the relationship in between these notes, which is pretty much the, the point. Once you understand this, everything is going to kind of make a lot of sense for you. Actually, I'm going to make this in a, in a color, okay? So, let's maybe this yellow, right? And that's when the other chart comes in. What we're looking at, if this is the root note, so if this is number one, okay? What is this note from the perspective of G? Let's have a look at the chart. So, if G is number one, what is B? Well, B is a third, okay? Let me write it down. So, that's a third, okay? I'm gonna write just three. Now, what is D from the perspective of G? Okay, right now I'm doing it with a chart. I could just write the result, but the, you know, I, I, I just wanna get through the process with you. So, from the point of view of G, the note, what is it? G, the note D is a fifth, okay? Let's get back to that. And I can keep going. So F sharp would be a major seven. A is gonna be a nine. C is gonna be an 11. And E is gonna be a 13. Now, this is what we call, and we looked at this in lesson one, a vertical structure, okay? This is the same scale, okay? but just in a different order. It's spelled as an arpeggio, or, as we see in a second, as a chord. So, in other words, we have G, B, D, F sharp, A, C, and E. So this is what we call an Ionian arpeggio, the same way this was a Ionian scale. But the consequence of this is not only we have an arpeggio, in fact, in your studies so far, when it came to major arpeggio, you studied the triad, in the case of key of G, it would be GBD, you studied major seven arpeggio, major nine arpeggios, seven, nine, six, nine, and the reason you did six, nine is because the 13 is equal to a six, don't forget that. Uh, you we did the entire Ionian arpeggio, but this is also a chord, okay? Because 135, as we have seen in the chart, 135 is a major chord, okay? And if I was to spell it completely, this would be a major 7, especially it would be a major 13, okay? Because I'm spelling all the notes all the way to the 13. But just to keep it simple, let's remember that that's major. Okay? In fact, what we're doing now, we're taking basically a scale and we are harmonizing it. Harmonizing a major scale. Because, and the word harmonizing implies that from the scale, now we're getting chords. Now, let's look at this second note now. And now that's where things become interesting. Let me do the same thing I just did for the very first note of the scale, but I'm going to do it for starting from the second note. Now I have A, skip a note, stuck in thirds. So this would be C. Play a note, 
skip a note, sorry. Play the following one. And that's E. And then we have G. Then we have B. Then we have D. And then we have F sharp. Okay. Now, let me give it uh, another color so we see the difference. Actually, I'm going to color all these together. So, so you see it does one thing. That's just one thing. And I'm going to do the same for this. So you see it's one thing. Okay. If we look at the relation, if this is one, okay, now A is one. What's the relation in between C and A in the key of A? And that's where, again, our chart comes back handy. So if A is the root, C, where is it? C is the flat three, okay? And I'm gonna do the same process for all the notes, for all the vertical notes. Oops. Here, so this is a flat three. The relation in between E and A, the interval, it's a fifth. In between G and A, this is a flat seven. In between B and A, it's a nine. In between D and A, it's an 11. And in between F sharp and A, that's a 13. Now, what does this mean? Let me just... Basically, what you've just seen in the case of this second scale is what in the future, I mean, actually in two lessons from now, because that's what we're going to be doing in two lessons from now, is what we call a Dorian. Okay, so now we're approaching mode, modal blank, okay, modes in general. Uh, it's going to be a minor scale and it's going to have minor arpeggios and minor chords connected to it. And if we analyze it uh, like we did so far, um, you'll see that this A, so 1 flat 3, 5, let's start from that, 1 flat 3, 5 is minor. And that's why when we studied Dorian, we assumed that we like, we, we treat it as a minor scale, a minor arpeggio, and a bunch of minor chords. Okay? I hope it's uh, kind of clear so far uh, and not too confusing. But let's remind ourselves that that's a minor. If I wanted to write the complete uh, Dorian uh, modal arpeggio, this would be a minor 13, because it's all the notes leading to a 13, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing for the third one, okay? So let's give it a different color. Uh, let's say blue. Actually, blue is taking away the lines too much. Let's do that. B. Skip a note, play the following one. So you get D, you get F sharp, you get A, you get C, you get E, and you get G. So if we look at the, um, at the intervals, again, considering this the root note this time, we get first, we get the interval there is a flat three in between B and D. The interval is a flat three. Then we have a five. We have a flat seven. C and B is a flat nine. I'll show it to you in a second. So we are, we are looking at B and here is your C. Flat two, flat nine. I wrote flat nine because I'm looking at it from the point of view of the second octave. But, you know, not that it would be incorrect. I mean, I would not write flat two, but it would not be totally incorrect, okay? Uh, from E and B, you have an 11. And from B and G, you have a flat 13, okay? Or a flat six. As you can see, one flat three, five, you are in the presence of a minor chord okay and if we call this ionian this is going to be our dorian this is going to be our phrygian in terms of vertical structure what's important to understand already at this stage is that now suddenly i have two minors not just uh, one and as we move forward 
we'll see that there is more than one major. And that's why I tended from the very beginning to call this an Ionian scale as opposed to a major scale, okay? Because as you will see in a second, there is more than one major. In fact, if we look at, let's take this one now, skip a note, play the following one, E, then you have G, then you have B, then you have D, then you have F sharp, and from F sharp, we're back to G. Sorry, well, we're going to A. So F sharp, skip a note, G, and then you are in A. If, if C is the root note, the relation between E and C is a third, G and C is a fifth, B and C is a major seven, uh, C and D is a nine, C and F sharp, now that's where it gets interesting, is a sharp 11. And C and A is a 13. Now as you can see that these are pedro here, and these are pedro here. They are both major. The only difference is this note. In Ionian, you have an 11th, and as we will see in the future, in Lydian, you have a sharp 11, which is a very distinctive sound. How does that affect us? Well, when we construct chords, now we have this note extra at our disposal in constructing major chords. So this is also a major, and in the future we will call this uh, a Lydian. Let's look at this one now. Let's give it a this color. In this case, we have D, F sharp, A, that's my phone, sorry for that, E, G, and from G we go to B. The relation, in, so if this is number one, the relation in between D and F sharp is a major third, D and A is a fifth, D and C is a flat seven, D and E is a nine, D and G is an eleventh, and D and B is a thirteenth. Now again, let's compare it to this particular arpeggio, one, three, five, major seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and let's look at this, one, three, five, flat seven. That's the major difference. And what this tells us is that this particular arpeggio, this particular chord is a dominant seven. So it's not a, it's a major or minor, but the moment you spell it with four notes, it's a dominant seven chord. So in this case, D7, okay? By the way, this is what we will call mixolydian when we study that particular mode. Now, sixth one. Let's give it this color. E, skip F sharp, we have G. Skip A, we have B. Then we get D. Then we get F sharp. Then we get A. And from A, we get C. Intervals relation. So if E is number one, G is a flat three. Uh, e and B, the relation is a fifth. E and D, the relation is a flat seven. E and F sharp, the relation is a nine. E and A, the relationship is an eleventh. And E and C, the relation is a flat thirteen. So, one flat three five, again, what kind of feminine flat seven? We are in minor. This is a minor chord. A minor chord and a minor arpeggio. When we study modes, this we will call this uh, Aeolian. So now, as you can see, you got three ways and a set of arpeggios that will come with that and a set of scales that will come with that. When it comes to minor, we got the second degree, so Dorian, a third degree, which is Phrygian, and the sixth degree, which is Aeolian. And so far, we also have two majors, uh, the first degree, which is um, Ionian, and the fourth degree, which is lead. Let's do the last one. Uh, color. I know this one should do. F sharp, 
skip a note, so we're stacking thirds. That's an A. That's a C. That's an E. From E, to, we go to G, so we are here. From G, we go to B. And from B, we go to D. Intervals. So F sharp, uh, sorry, F sharp, yeah, it's the root note. From F sharp to A, the interval is a flat three. From F sharp to C, the interval is a flat five. Uh, let me show you that. So from F sharp to C, that's a flat five, or sharp four, or sharp 11. And you'll see in a second why I called it a flat five. From F sharp to E is a flat seven. From F sharp to G is a flat nine. From F sharp to B is an 11. From F sharp to D is a flat 13. Now, one flat three, flat five, flat seven. Let's look at our charts one second. And one flat three, flat five, flat seven. Now, that's an alpha diminished chord, okay? Let's go back and half diminished. These are basically, we just harmonized our scale. What that means is we started from uh, an horizontal line, so single notes. Uh, I'm gonna show you to, to you on a guitar in a second. But from that, we got chords. So we harmonized it. And uh, now we can look at the complete chart, uh, the, the, the one that hopefully you know, you'll download uh, and hopefully will be useful for you, which is this, which is basically what I just did, a complete version. So you have all your major scales. In this case, we did G. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. And the relative harmonization. So G, A minor. B minor, C, D7, E minor, F sharp, half diminished. Because what's happening here, thanks to disharmonization, we know that the first chord is major. So G major, in the case of the key of G, obviously, because we're doing this in G now. Uh, A minor, B minor, C major, D7, E minor, F sharp, half diminished. So let me show you how this works uh, on a guitar. Um, I'm gonna just do it on an acoustic guitar. You know, there is no, you know, no need to plug in anything, anything more than this. So let's say, you know, I have my, um, we've done this in G, so let's do this in G. So G major. Okay. Harmonizing this, according to what we just did, kind of sounds like this. So G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D7, E minor, F sharp minor, F sharp half diminished, back to G major. So this is the harmonization of this scale. Okay? I hope it makes sense so far, but it's, it's that easy. So if we want to create a rule uh, out of it, so that uh, uh, we're not stuck in any particular in any particular key, I did this example in G, but this rule apply to any diatonic scale. So let's say uh, the most common diatonic scale C C I onion. So C D E F G uh, A B C. That is the scale. Okay, so that would be, you know, you studied this in the one, in the first 15 lessons, right? But now if I want to make chords out of it, it would be C major. So the sequence is always major, minor, minor, major, dominant seven, minor, half diminished. That sequence stays no matter what the key, right? We are harmonizing a scale. So C major. D, second note, minor. E minor. F major. G7. A minor. B half diminished. Back to C major. And that's the harmonization of it. Okay? Now, 
In a second, I'm going to show you uh, some of the practical application. The, at the level where you are, at least uh, with the 16 lessons we've done so far, probably like you might be more advanced than that. Uh, so I apologize, you know, not the level where you are, literally, the level compared to the lessons. Um, given that, uh, one thing you can do straight away is, for example, analyzing a song. Okay, so let's say that there is a song that you like for copyright reasons. I'm not going to play a pop song or something. The last thing I want is YouTube to decide that, you know, copywriting stuff. Let's say I have a song in front of me, uh, maybe a reggae song, uh, and the chord progression, maybe it's kind of simple and it just goes uh, D minor, like I'm going to do it this way, an E minor. This is a song, okay? And I want to have some fun um, soloing on top of that, okay? Well, what I want to do, first of all, is to see if these chords belong to the same diatonic key, okay? And what I mean by that is, like, I want to know if these two chords might belong to... Uh, let me find it. Might belong to any of this, this part here. So I'm going to look if any of these lines, so any of these keys, these are the diatonic keys, okay, contains those two chords. In this case, we were looking at D minor and E minor. So here is D minor, here is E minor. So actually the key of C contains those two chords. I could go on and see if any other of this contains those same two chords. Uh, you will find that uh, you know, this is probably the best option in this case. But what that means in practical terms for us is, well, a C major scale, a C Ionian scale, so the scales that you've studied so far, would allow you to solo freely, improvise if you want to, over this progression. you've done in, as I said in this first 15 lesson. So in other words, what you, what you got here at this point is you can analyze any chord progression of any song uh, that you like and see first of all do the chords of that song are they diatonic to any particular scale? If they are, you already know how to solve on top of that. And as you can see you now like that's when Armian theory really becomes a dictionary and something that uh, tells you, yeah, you can do that, and that's the scale that you should use for that, okay? In time, as we add minor arpeggios and uh, dominant seven arpeggios and, and all of that, because the arpeggios are guide tones, as we discussed in the previous lesson, your soloing will become even more uh, articulated if you want it to be, obviously. Uh, and that's why we discussed the vocabulary here, okay, rather than a lick. Uh, but, as a starting point, you can already tackle a solo just with the Ionian scales that we've done in these previous uh, 15 lessons. Now, what happens is that, so let's say you're analyzing a progression, and you cannot find a particular scale uh, in the charts that covers the entire progression. In other words, let's say, for example, I have, uh, let's, let's, let's stick with this uh, diatonic kind of thing and a reggae kind of feel. Let's say I have a song that goes uh, D minor, E minor, F minor, and G minor, and then back to, okay? D minor, E minor. F minor, G minor, okay? I have these four chords in the song, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, what can, what scales can I use to play on top of this, you know, to, 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 to solve on top of that. So what you want to do is go back to your charts, and for D minor, E minor, as you can see, we can use C major, but also now we have so half of our, our half of our progression 
in terms of soloing can be solved by simply playing a C major scale on top of that, okay? C Ionian. But I also had F minor and G minor, and F minor and G minor are not here. Here there is F major and here there is G7. So I'm going to look at the other keys here until I find one that has F minor and G minor, okay? And in this case, I find that, that D sharp or E flat, which are the same thing, contains F minor and G minor. Let me see if there is anything else. This one contains G minor, but not F minor. So I will disregard it for the moment. No, this one doesn't have it. This one doesn't have it, doesn't have it, doesn't have it, doesn't have it. No and no. So what I know now is that the first two bars of my song needs a C major scale. If I want to C major C Ionian scale, if I want to solo on top of that, and when the F minor comes in, I'm going to use E flat Ionian. And as I said, you know, I think for as much as uh, this might sound slightly confusing, maybe uh, I hope you're starting to realize that since you know, after 15 lesson lessons, you know Ionian scales in all keys and in five positions, which means that you know them all across the guitar. So what you're trying to do now is just to go from one key to another key. And if you remember lesson 15, that's when we did um, uh, our interval of fourths. And if you're already practicing an interval of fourths, that's much harder than this, because here you're just going from, you know, key of C, key of E flat, back to key of C, go back to key wave flat. You're not going across 12 different keys. So in this case, what you end up with is say like, you know, let's say uh, uh, C. F minor, and now I'm in B flat. G minor, I'm still in E flat. Back to C. I'm still in C. Sorry for the grammatic. F minor. And I'm in B flat. In, I'm in, in the key of E flat now. Something that is important mentioning is the fact that. The number of notes we designed to use to create this harmonized sequence kind of influences how this sequence spells. Let me make this uh, more clear. Let's say I'm harmonizing just using triads, okay? Just the first three notes of each chord, which is something that happens in a lot of pop music, if you think about it. Not a lot of pop music uses a standard embellished type of chords. Um, so in that case, since we have one three five, one th flat three five, one flat three five, one three five, one three five, one flat three five, one flat three flat five, this progression reads major minor minor major. This reads as major, and the deep, this, the reason is because you're only going all the way to the fifth. You're not adding the flat seven, and is a major triad, then minor, then diminished. And again, the reason, let me show it to you on the family of chords. The reason being that until we have one flat three five, one, sorry, one flat three flat five and one flat three flat five, they're actually the same. Same thing you could say one three five for major, one three five for dominant seven. And that's going to become this kind of slight different is going to become relevant uh, once we analyze, say, a normal type of pop uh, pop songs. So that's the sequence if we are using triads. Okay? Actually, let me just write it. If using triads. Okay? So this will be it. Uh, let me give it the color so it kind of makes sense. Okay? I don't like this color. This one, more clear. If we use four note chords, so if we use extended 
triads. And by extended triads, this should remind you some of the exercises uh, we actually did uh, when we were studying scales. Now this chord sequence reads as major 7, minor 7, minor 7, major 7, dominant 7. Now, because we have four notes, one, three, five, seven, we're reading this now, okay? This is a minor seven, and this is final half diminished. So this if using extended triads, triads, okay? Uh, and so let's color this. I don't know, this color, so we can definish it. In terms of arpeggios, we already seen it when we started it. We can go straight to triads, extended triads, major nine, six nine, etc. In music, generally, this is the chord. One three five is what tells me, okay, I'm playing a G chord in this case. Okay, this part here, which we can call an upper structure. For example, these are embellishments. These are colors you can add to your chords. In fact, when we studied the chords, I created chords that contained some of these intervals. Okay, as guitar players, you know, six strings guitar players, we cannot possibly play seven notes at the same time. So we tend to omit sometimes the first, sometimes the fifth. We discuss that when we do chords, but. Uh, the logic behind it, that's what I want you to understand now, is that this is your basic triad and pop music is just full of these things. If you look at, for example, uh, oh, sorry, if you look at, for example, music like R&B from the 60s or even R&B, you know, more modern forms of R&B, uh, it's not unusual that you start seeing maybe chords which have colors to it. So a 1, 3, 5 and maybe with a major 7 added to it or 1, 3, 5 and maybe a 9 is added to it. Maybe less common is to add an 11, surely adding a 6 or a 13 to it. Now, the reason I can do that is because this piece of theory tells me, okay, these are the notes that I can add to a chord one, which leads me neatly to one last concept that needs to be clarified here about this chart. As you can see here, I used numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you know that when it comes to scales, I like using numbers, you know, and so that I'm uh, I'm not confined without a single key. So a Ionian scale sequence would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you gotta understand that that's within this concept. Okay, so a Ionian scale would be one, two, three, four, five, six, major seven. You take those notes together, you have a Ionian scale. As you can see, when it comes to the harmonization of the chords, I'm not using anymore one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but I'm using Roman numbers. Okay, this will be chord number one, chord number two, chord number three, chord number four, five, six, and seven. Well, this this kind of allows us to do something else. When it comes to chord progressions, um, we can start defining them by Roman numbers. So a progression 251 means in the key of C, who mean basically D minor, G7, C major. Uh, 1625 uh, would be in the key of D, for example. It would be 1, D major, 6, uh, B minor, 2, E minor, 5, a7. Why do we do that? Why we we start calling progressions by Roman numbers as opposed to say, I don't know, G, E minor, D, uh, F major or something? Because that's going to help you in transposing songs. That's one of the first applications I can think of in those terms. And uh, I'm going to show you in a minute uh, what, I'm, what do I mean by that. So, so far, what you studied is chord number one. Okay, that's what we did in first 15 weeks. Okay, we exploited Ionian from the point of view of the scales across the entire guitar, the point of view of the chords across the entire guitar, and from the point of view of the arpeggio. So we, we explored chord number one. With this kind of system I taught you today, even just knowing major scales, just chord number one would allow you to create melodies, even if the progression is not just C. Okay, and that's already like a massive step forward. So let's see where this uh, information about, uh, you know, describing chords in Roman numerals uh, comes in. Let's take, for example, like, let me think of a pop song. 
um, you too, with or without you, you know, like uh, being it for them. Uh, if I remember well, off the top of my head, um, chords should be kind of G major, uh, D major, E minor, C. This is a progression that, you know, tons of songs of this. Right? Now, let me look if uh, in our chart there is any particular key center that uh, covers all these chords. Just by hearing it in terms of tension resolution, it feels to me that the song wants to resolve in G. So the first thing, I'm, the first key I'm gonna check is actually G, okay? So let's have a look. Uh, so G, here it is. So G is there, D7, so D is there, and since we're playing triads, that's why, now you'll understand it even better, here, since we're only playing triads, that's funny enough, this is in G already, <laughs> so that really helps. Uh, the, the D is treated like a major, okay? Not like a, like a D7. Uh, Cool. Let's go back to our chart. So we say D, then we say E minor. Here is my E minor, and then we say C, and here is C. So all these uh, chords of the progression belong to the key of G. Fair enough. Now let me look at it from a numeral point of view. This would be a one, five, six, four progression. Okay. Remember this number one five, six, four. So one is G, five is D, six is E minor, and four is C. So one, five, six, four. Now, why that can be Andy? Well, in my experience, think of it, if I think of it in terms of one, five, six, and four. Mm, what happens is when you work with singers in particular, even if you're a singer yourself, and let's say that you you want to cover this song, you decide that you want to play with or without you by you two. But the original key of the song doesn't really suit you, okay? Or maybe the singer you're working with, maybe it's a female singer, so she's going to pitch it a bit higher, or maybe it's, uh, it's going to be pitched a bit lower. How can I transpose the song kind of relatively quickly or with, you know without getting an ADEC out of it. Well, as, you know, with experience, again, once you memorize those charts uh, in time, you know, it, as I said, you don't, have, you don't even have to. You can simply look at that progression, one, six, one, five, six, and four, in a different key. In other words, in other, let's say the singer says, no, I mean, this key, key of G, you know, I don't fancy it, it's too low for me or it's too high for me, whatever. Uh, let's try, I don't know, uh, two tones up. So I can simply, you can simply go to the chart and look at, I don't know, two tones up, okay? From G, you go to key of B. Kind of weird, but fine. And now you're looking at the same Roman numbers. One, five, six, four. In the key of B, one is B. Then you have F sharp major, because as I said, we're only using the first three notes. Then you have G sharp minor, and then you have E major, okay? So remember this, I'm gonna perform it in a second. B, F sharp, uh, G, my, uh, G sharp minor, and E. So, B. In other words, we went from the original song and quickly transposed the song into okay. And now the singer can do you know, can do a job, and I could try you know any 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 key. Because I'm thinking in terms of one, five, six, four, instead of thinking in the necessarily in the key of G. Okay, and that's where this idea of using Roman numbers really comes handy. And there are very, you know, in music the one, six, two, five is a very 
you know, common progression. Two, five, one is a very common progression. One, four, five. As you can see, I call them that way because I'm. Um, it's independent from the, the key. It's a bit like saying, let's play a blues in D. And for all of you out there that play the blues, you know the 12-bar blues, you know the stretchers. You're, you're just transposing it in whatever is going to be the key for the particular performance. Same thing is basically happening here. We're applying the same concept to, to diatonic. So this chart, now at this stage, is helping you in two different ways. So you have a bunch of chords and you are... Uh, creating a melody on top of that. In our case, we created a solo, but if you were a songwriter, for example, uh, you could, I have a bunch of chords, I don't know what the melody of the vocals should be, I know now which scale from which scale I should get my melodies. So for our D minor, E minor, when we say we're going to use C major scale over it, well, those notes could be like the melody line of the vocals. We kind of went further and then played an even more complex melody than probably a vocalist would do because we're playing a solo. But a solo is a melodic thing, okay? Let's not forget that. So we, we got that out of this piece of theory we're discussing today, but we also got a technique how we can transpose the song rather quickly. As I say, the practical application, the most common that I can think of right now is transposing, transposing uh, pop songs when we're covering them because the singer might want it in a different key, or yourself, if you're the singer yourself. There is other applications that we're going to study out of this. Uh, off the top of my head, i um, thinking of the opposite of what we did today. So I have a melody. So I wrote maybe a melody or something, and I need to harmonize it. So I need to find the chords that would support it. We're going to talk about that, but still going to come out of these charts. As I said before in this lesson, this is really a lot that we can get out of just from understanding the logic behind this. Okay. Um, chord substitutions, I think I mentioned, uh, embellishing chords. As I, uh, as I suggested, you know, like depending on the style of music, pop music most of the time kind of relies on just triads. Uh, but let's say you have a progression like like now, actually, like uh, like the one we just did. Uh, let's say I want to start embellishing it. But now I know this is chord number one, chord number uh, five, chord number six, and chord number four. And if we look at uh, these charts, I mean, we'll study this. I'm not asking you to, to, to understand this necessarily now, but so that you can see the potential. Chord number one, which is this, I know what extension I can use, what embellishments I can use, okay? What's the upper stretcher here? Chord number five, which is this, I also tell me, okay, if I want, I can add a flat seven to my triad, I can add a nine, I can add an 11, I can add a 13. Chord number six, same thing. I know it's a minor until here, and these are the extensions I can add. Uh, and then chord number four, it's a major, and these are the extensions that I can add. So once you're familiar with that, now the same song maybe might become, maybe you want to do, uh, you know, a more R&B version of it. You want to cover it, but not strumming type of technique. Now this can become chord number one. As you can see, I'm adding colors to it. And it's not a random process. So the, 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 the extra notes that I'm adding to the, to the triads are defined by the, the, that table. So for, you know, in this case, I'm doing a major seven or a major 13. And here I was doing like a seven or a nine, dominant chord with a ninth. Uh, in 11th, minor 11th, and um, major seven with a sharp 11. Uh, why am I doing that? Because I can. <laughs> as simple, as simple as that. But uh, in this case, I'm only adding embellishments, colors, and that chart I, we created kind of tells me which one I can add. In the future, we'll also study the concept of alterations, and alterations are the notes which are not there. So in a way, like at this stage, you can think of it as the wrong notes, but uh, in the future, we'll see that they're not wrong. I mean, they're just 
alterations that are alterating compared to compared to this uh, compared to this chart, as a matter of fact. Okay. Now, one very last thing I want to quickly discuss with you is during lesson one, lesson four, I believe lesson seven. Anyway, every time we discussed a new scale position, so we started from this one. This was lesson one, right? Among the exercises, you beside the intervals, you, you also did exercises which were called triads and extended triads, okay? And at that time I told you, you know, just do it, and at some point I'll explain you where is that coming from. Well, now, I guess, you can understand where is that coming from. Because all you're doing when you're doing those triads and extended triads in position, you know, in, in each cage, you're actually spelling the chords that the harmonization that we just did, but in, uh, in an arpeggio form. In other words, all you're doing is you're playing this sequence, major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished. And when we do extended triads, what you're playing is major 7, minor 7, minor 7, major 7, dominant 7, minor 7, and half diminished. In other words, although we haven't done yet minor arpeggios or dominant 7 arpeggios or half diminished arpeggios, as a matter of fact, you're already playing them. So when we do them, uh, is you're going to feel already kind of familiar with it. And that's the trick. So let's take, for example, this position. And one of the exercises I asked you to do was this. I'll stop that at the octave, okay? And of course, inverted version and all that. If you think about it, let me start from G, okay? So you see. This is a triad of G, this is G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, F sharp diminished, back to G major. So you're creating that harmonization that I just described to you as a piece of theory. That's what's happening there. spelling the chords within the scale. You're harmonizing the scale by doing that. And when we're doing extended triads, now we're adding the major seven, we're adding the fourth note in the sequence. So the major seven or minor seven, or according to um, major, minor, minor, major, dominant seven, minor, half diminished. So starting from G, you studied this. So in other words, what you're playing is G major 7, A minor 7, B minor 7, C major 7, D dominant 7, E minor, F half diminished, so uh, F minor 7 flat 5, back to G major 7. And because we were using the cage system, we started from this. So we started actually from the seventh. So we started from the half diminished. So in a way, with your page, you're already spelling that harmonization. You already did that. It's just that at that time, I mean, some of you probably already knew that. Uh, and even if you don't, now that is playing that kind of exercises. You are discovering the chords within the scale. Uh, and as we progress and we do minor arpeggios, like more extended studies of them in dominant seven and half diminished, once we're done that, you kind of cover the entire diatonic, kind of diatonic system. So like ma so-called major modes, okay? So before we conclude, I just uh, wanted to show you like uh, a practical application of uh, what we did. Let's say, for example, I have a song, uh, the progression is, um, I don't know, C minor, D minor, E flat. Uh, so something like this. I'm going to actually loop it, okay? Um, Major, they all belong 
to a diatonic key of B flat, which means I can use B flat Ionian over this progression if I want to solo on top of it. Uh, that's the practical application. So we started B flat, we started Ionian in all positions. So let's say B flat, shape of a G. and you start realizing the potential that even just this little piece of information regarding harmony and theory can provide you with. So my suggestion is like take any song that you know you're particularly a fan of and and uh, and see if diatonically it falls into one single scale. As I mentioned during the lesson, let's see what happens if something falls across two different scales. Uh, I'm going to use the progression we used before, so D minor, E minor, and then F minor and G minor. And let me loop it, three, four. Thank you. 
course, like having to change key adds a layer of uh, more complexity to what we're doing. But in time, beside the diatonic harmony, because this is what it is, so it's the harmony that comes out of a single major scale. Uh, at times in the future, we're going to also look at pentatonic harmony, so harmony that comes off pentatonic scales. And again, there's a lot of music that has been designed on that. Anyway, this should give you a starting point in terms of you understanding the background of, you know, music. As I said, this is not just for guitar. This applies to, to, to any instrument. So if you need to remember anything about this in terms of memorizing, as I said, you print out the charts, you know, put them in a folder and when you need them, you'll consult them. Um, nevertheless, uh, try and remember if you can that major, minor, minor, major, dominant seven, minor, off diminished in terms of harmonizing uh, Ionian scale, because that will come back handy. Um, I think this concludes these lessons at this stage. Uh, if you have any question, I know this, this is not the simplest of things to, you know, to sink in, but I'm going to talk about these things in the future and show you further applications of it. So, you know, uh, don't worry if it's going to take some time. It's kind of normal. As I said, this is just a dictionary. It's not going to get in the way of you playing as you notice so far with done without. But it will help uh, understanding certain concepts. With an Ionian, next lesson, I'm planning to start discussing right hand picking techniques before we move on to minor first. So we're going to look into Dorian, actually, scales and arpeggios, and then we will do dominant seven so that uh, at, by then you will have major, minor and dominant seven kind of chords, arpeggios and scales, which already is going to really help you in terms of you performing pretty much any type of music. After that, we're going to delve into farther into mod, modes and all the rest of the modes. So thank you very much for following uh, this entire lesson. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, if, you, if you feel like uh, supporting this uh, monumental project of mine, which I'm conducting, uh, in establishing like a vocabulary for the guitar, uh, it's very much appreciated, uh, you know, if you support me on Patreon, of course. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to keep these lessons free. I'm going to create some extra content for, you know, different tiers, so backing tracks and stuff, as I mentioned, and so look out for that too, especially if you if you decide to join me on Patreon. Uh, aside from this, uh, I really wish you well, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.